Up to you. Well, good afternoon, everybody. First of all, I want to say, like, like all the other speakers have said, thank you very much for the invitation to be here. It's a real honour. Uh, I'm very proud to be here and part of this fantastic um, uh, event. And uh, hopefully, um, after the whole day is finished, everybody's going to continue supporting the product in the way that it's been supported unbelievably all this time. Okay, now, my main purpose today is really to answer questions from you. Um, but I, I figured that in order for me to uh, facilitate that, the best thing I can do, first of all, is to tell you my career within Commodore, because a lot of people have no idea what I did and where I did it and so on and so forth. So I'm going to take you through that and some of the things that we in the UK did to uh, maximise business. And then I'm going to take you through what happened with the UK management buyout bid and, and what happened and why it didn't happen. Uh, and then after that, I'll answer all the questions. Is, is that okay? Does that work? Okay. Right. I joined Commodore in 1983. Um, actually, this very month in 1983. And um, I was employed to sell the, the then range of business products, this is before we had PCs, to sell pets. Um, and I didn't know anything about computers, and to be honest with you, I still don't. That's the truth. Um, but I was employed to, to sell these product range into the retail market in the UK. And when I, when I was interviewed for this position, um, the lady that interviewed me, she said, David, the one thing about Commodore is, is that there are lots and lots of opportunities people are writing, and um, you know, it's a really good company to come out for that reason. Now, I've been doing this job um, for, I think, about two months, and um, I've been doing some research around the, the retail stores, and I was in a store in the north of England, and that same lady ran me in the shop. How she tracked me down, I have no idea, because we didn't have mobile phones in 83. Anyway, she said, David, do you remember I said, I said you that opportunities are right? She said, well, yours is just the reason. She said, our consumer division, which is you know, selling the big 20s and 64s, the 64 sales are going crazy. We need somebody to sell into uh, the major stores, and you're it. So I, I joined the consumer division, really kind of by accident. And the truth of the matter is that you know, we got very successful at it. We, 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 I think we did a pretty good job. Um, so then, that's why in October, I uh, took over as a consumer products and national accounts manager. In 1984, as a result of some of the work that I did, I was promoted to sales manager. And then in 1987, December of 1987, uh, I was made a director of the UK company, sales and marketing director. Um, the guy I worked for in Commodore UK, uh, Steve Franklin, the young guy, and because of the success that he and I did together, I had the feeling that he wasn't going to be going anywhere. So if I wanted to progress, I needed to do something else. And the opportunity arose, um, uh, his position as general manager of CIL, which is the holding company, or was holding company, based in Basel in Switzerland. And I, I, I applied for and got that position. And I was responsible for 37 countries, countries where we did not have an operating subsidiary office. And man, that's got to be the best job in the world. Fantastic. In traveling the world and getting paid for it. Can't be bad. Um, and even if I say to myself, I did a, a, a pretty damn good job, I increased the turnover immensely. Uh, and I loved it all the while. Then in January, of 1992, um, I'd been pushing and pushing and pushing because the crazy thing about Commodore it was a uh, whilst it was a Bahamian company, uh, it was listed on on the stock exchange in Wall Street, and yet the business that we did in the US was absolutely a business. And I've been saying I want I want to kick some arms. Let's let's get some business. So I was um, sent to Westchester and. Uh, and I, I, I actually, there was, there was a, it's a long story to onboard, but we were doing the business, I cleared all of that, and 
we started getting business in, in the US, which is terrific. Um, okay, then um, I was uh, I was forced, if you like, back to uh, the UK to take over as MD of the company. Um, but when I was asked to do that, I made it absolutely clear that my forte is sales and marketing. I'm not a financial person, and so I asked for it and, and got uh, Colin, Colin Bradford, who was in fact a financial director already. Uh, he and I became joint managing directors, and it was a really, really good match. We worked very well together. Now, I think one of the things that really triggered my career and the growth of my career was I had a conversation with Steve Franklin and I said, if you want to make business in this country, from now on, we're not going to sell computers, we're going to sell dreams. Because that's the key to it. We needed to get computers into the homes. Get computers into the homes, the software manufacturers will develop more, and then people in the homes will, will grow their computers and so on and so forth. Okay, now, starting here with the, the 64, I can absolutely tell you that in the UK, we kept the Commodore 64 alive for two years longer than it ever should have been. Why? Because we did these things here, these bundles. And they were hugely successful, it was it's really quite incredible. And in fact, um, I can tell you that the, in that Connoisseur collection, um, I think we were the first company to sell a computer, but certainly a mass market computer, with a mouse. And in that, in that uh, box there is a product from, from Japan um, called the Neos uh, uh, Mouse and Cheese. It was an art package. But they just, you know, we're kind of always trying to be ahead of the game, if you want. A lot of people don't know that we actually did, in the UK, we did a PC start of that, when the PC 10 and 20 and 30 were launched. Again, what we did is we put, put it into a package, um, to, to, because nobody even had to put a PC together. So what we did is we, we actually produced a video which featured Tim Brooke Taylor, from the, who's a comedian, a very well-known comedian in the UK, featured him, and that was included in the pack, and you put the video on and it told you how to put it all together and how to make it work. Pretty in, innovative idea, I think, at the time. And then we come to the 500. Um, I guess the one that really um, kicked it off was, was the Batman pack. That was a, a phenomenal success. Um, and I'll give all credit to Ocean Software for having the guts. I, I went to see them one day and I said, guys, I, I need to ask you something. And you're either going to say yes, or you're going to send them in in the white coats and take me away. And I said to them, right, this is what I want to do. I want to, they had just been to the, to the States. They just paid one million dollars for the right to produce Batman, the movie, software. And I said, I want you to give me Batman, the movie, software exclusively for two months in the pack. I, I only want to commit to 10,000 pieces and I don't want to pay you much for it. <laughs> so they said, send for the men in the white coats, of course. <laughs> but what I explained to them was, I said, so you guys need to, us to sell hardware, that allows you to sell more software. And I said, the thing is that if you do this for us, we will work together with you. And that packaging design will reflect in your marketing and our marketing we had a lot of money to spend. So anyway, they had the balls to do it. But given that, incredible balls. And it was massively successful. I can tell you in the 12-week period at Christmas when we first launched this, I didn't take 10,000. I took 184,000 pieces of software because that's how many meals we sold in 12 weeks. Stunning. Another thing we did, which was good at the time, we signed up for Chelsea Football Club, who are now, of course, Premier, top of the league. I, don't, I wouldn't say, we always knew they were in the top four or five, but we never really expected them to be in the top, but it just shows how we were kind of ahead of the game. And on that day, when, when we, we paid that money out to them, we actually paid all the money to them, of course, and that was the largest ever shirt sponsorship deal in football history when we did that. And you can see there some of the results of it, and, um, and it, it, it was fantastically successful for us. Then we come to the 1200, and again, the same policy, creating bundles that's, that make, make the figures. They're not computers, they're dreams. People see those bundles and they say, yeah, that's what I want to do. And then we 
come to the CD32 launch, now, you must remember at this particular point in time, um, Commodore was con considerably strapped for catch, terrible position. But they asked us to do the launch. So what we did is we, we, we actually took the Science Museum in, in London and, and did our launch there. Does anybody recognize that guy? Chris Evans. It just shows, again, how much we were ahead of the time. He is now probably <laughs> the most well-known presenter in the world, now that he's going to be the presenter of Top Gear, which, as you know, is probably the most successful television program. But there, that's how I was doing that all those years ago. That's one of the, one of the few moments we managed to get out for the CD32. Now, a lot of people say, Nobody's, nobody is marketing properly. Well, I decided I was going to take Sega head on. Because on the day, of, well, actually about a week before the launch of the CD32, Tom Kalinske did, a, did an interview in a PC magazine, and he was asked, what about 32-bit games consoles? And he said, and I quote, can't be done. If anybody could do it, it would be Sega, and we're not doing it, it can't be done. A week later, we launched it. So it gave me the most fantastic opportunity to really hit home. Um, that's the first thing we did. And then what about this, folks? Um, this is same as advertising. To be this good takes ages. To be this good, good takes Sega. But I went one, one better than that. That's Sega's head office. That's my advert. <laughs> to be this good takes Sega ages. <laughs> interesting thing is that about a week later was our industry dinner and um, uh, uh, Alexander, I can't use his first name, um, who was the MD of the same UK, he was up there of course and he walked up to our table and he said, a bit close to home Mr. Pleasant, a bit close to home. <laughs> and I said, look, Nick, uh, Nick Alexander said, Nick, we need must, we need must, and everybody was laughing, it was so good. Nice to get one up. Okay, now, as I said, I want to talk to you about the, uh, the, the uh, UK, the CBM UK management buyout um, and, and exactly what went on. Because there's been lots of talk and speculation, but I'll tell you the truth. Okay, Colin, as I just explained here, Colin and I were joint MDs, and Colin is one of the most financially brilliant people I've ever met in my life. He is incredible. And we sat down and said, what do we need to do? We need to do a business plan. So Colin and I prepared a fully comprehensive business plan. Trust me, everything you can imagine. We estimated it would cost us 15 million to buy the assets at the auction. And we were pretty well spot on with that. Um, but we had to go beyond that. We needed 35 million dollars to keep the company operating for the next six or seven months, mainly, not only to pay wages and overheads, but also, nobody selling components was gonna to sell to us on credit terms. They'd all just been burnt big time by Commodore, and the last thing they were gonna do was just give us a credit term. So we knew we'd have to spend 35 million bucks. So that was all factored in. Okay, once we've got um, the viable business plan, we approach Keepers and Librand, who are one of the best specialists in that kind of um, fundraising. They have loads of investors. And we sat down with them, and they handed our, our business plan to all their accountants and went over it with a fine tooth bow. There was one or two minor little changes, and then they approved it, and they said it was a fantastic business plan, and it was. Now, Coopers and Library then contacted all of their investors, potential investors. They had a lot of, of um, high wealth individuals who had five million, six million, eight million to, to invest. And we pulled together a consortium of those investors. And we were also approached by a Chinese manufacturing company um, called New Star Electronics, uh, who had at that, up to that moment in time, they'd been knocking off and ripping off Sega Nintendo products and selling them in Japan, uh, sorry, into China. But we figured what a great match because that was a manufacturing operation 
they were looking to get legal, they wanted to get legal, and this would have been a perfect vehicle. So we, we raised 50 million bucks. And New Star Electronics, they committed half of it, 25 million. Based on having see, uh, seemingly raised the required funds, Keepers and my band um, prepared for all the necessary documents to make our bid legal and formal. Just a few days prior to the auction, New Star Electronics announced that they were pulling out to our consulting. They didn't say why. We have subsequently found out why. But they said they're not, they're not going to put the money out. We could not ask the other investors to put 25 million in because they would have lost them. If you don't have 50 million, you can't make it work. Simple as that. So once we received that devastating news, we had to go back to all the other investors and say, I'm really sorry, but it's not my own. Unless we can raise another 25 million in the next three days, forget it. It later transpired that New Star Electronics had been duped by the ESCOM people. They'd gone to them and said, listen, don't put your money in with those boys. If you just hang in the background, we'll buy it, and then we'll let you come in for a lot less than 25 million bucks. It subsequently, of course, uh, uh, transpires that they had no intention whatsoever of doing anything with Amiga. But as you all know the story, same thing. The modest Amiga activity undertaken by ESCOM was only a token gesture, so I think we all know that. Um, and they never did anything with it. Now, it came uh, from our point of view that the, the research, the due diligence that Colin and I did was completely justified. We knew exactly what we needed in terms of cash flow to fund the Amiga business, uh, which, as you now know, ESCOM had no intention. Or oh, they didn't have the cash either, no, nowhere near enough money. Now, as you probably know, um, Commodore UK was by far the most profitable of all the, UK, of all the subsidiaries in the world. Testament to that is the fact that we were the very last company to declare bankruptcy 18 months after the parent company went. We declared bankruptcy. Um, and that was because we were buying all the stock from every other subsidiary as they closed, we were buying all the stock and kept trading and kept the name alive. Now, something that most people do not know, Commodore UK, at that moment in time, we had £6 million pounds worth of tax credits. We went to ESCOM, Colin and I went to, to ESCOM and sat down with them and said, you should buy Commodore UK as a going concern. Why, they said. Why? Because we've got £6 million pounds worth of credit. So if you just put your operation through our offices, keep it trading, that means that you can make loads and loads and loads of profit and not have to pay any tax on it, which is a gift for anybody starting out in, in a company. It turned us down. It turned us down. Bert Van Tienen, who was a general manager of Commodore uh, Holland, uh, he was a very bad guy. Let me tell you, right? Now I can tell you lots of things about it, but he was not a good guy. He's passed away, and I think the, the other of Eskimo has also passed away, so it's a shame that they're not here to defend themselves, but they couldn't. They couldn't defend themselves because everything I've told you is the truth. Anybody else? Yeah. Here. What was your long term business plan? Longer term. Okay, that's a, that's a very good question. I'm glad you asked that because we, we, we thought this out very, very thoroughly. Okay, let's, let's talk first of all about the then current Amiga range. What we planned to do was to, we, we'd already sourced um, and been working with a German company to produce a, um, uh, what do you call the, uh, the, the PC case, you know, the floor standing case, which, tower, that's the word I'm looking for, sorry, just went out of my head. Yeah, a tower type case. And our plan was that we would, every, every Amiga that we developed, we would design the PCB so that you, there was an upgrade path. We, we came up with the, with the name um, uh, for, uh, Amiga Infinity. And the idea was that if you wanted to get into the Amiga computing arena, you could start off with a low, a low cost product, and then you could take it eventually, take it into your dealer, and he would take the PCB out, 
and put and, and into the new case and put it up to grade and you could add all your peripherals. It was not ever going to be a really long term thing, but it would have answered a lot of problems, a lot of criticisms that we had. So that was what we were going to do with the current range of the product. Um, we were also uh, incredibly um, impressed by the work that the guys were doing in Westchester. They were working on a, 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 a chip uh, that had used a risk-based core, and they had 3D rendering engines and everything else you can imagine. They had 5.1 stereo, all this stuff was all under, under development. It was phenomenal. So we would have funded that further and further and further. But in order to, to maintain a, a profit for Commodore, because Commodore was hardly ever in profit in all its history, what we decided we were going to do, we were, the first thing we were going to do was take the CBM name, CBM, and we were going to license that name to anybody who wanted to produce a PC or anything in, in the business arena. We would have, what we would have is a team of quality control people to make sure that whatever they produced stood up to our test and was a quality product. And they would pay us a license for the name. That's income coming in, and no expenditure. If they wanted us and our team of salespeople to sell their products for them as well, that's an additional form of revenue. No, ex no, no expenditure on our part, but revenue coming in. The Commodore man, we were going to do exactly the same thing. The Commodore in Europe was in every electrical shop in, 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 in around Europe. And we could have sold anything with a plug on it. To toasters, kettles, you name it, right? With the, with the name Commodore. Because we had the distribution channels. And again, that would have been our source. Somebody pays us a royalty for it. And then we, if, if they were the rest of it, would sell that product also. This is all revenue coming in on a regular basis without expenditure, which allows you the, the luxury to invest in the longer term development product. The same thing with Amiga clothing. Do you know how many times we were asked, have you got Amiga jackets, have you got, you know, tracksuits or t-shirts or whatever? That's enough, something else that we would have licensed. So that's, that's kind of an overview of the plan. Um, we, we, we are a great believer in, in the relationship between the developers in the US and the software developers, particularly in the UK. And we were going to have a team of, of people from the States coming to the UK and working very closely with all the software developers. Because we needed the job. It's, I mean, it's as obvious as the nose on your face. That's what we were going to do. in time to make a bid. We obviously did something, again, we did something right. Our, our, our downfall is that we trusted the Chinese, and that's a lesson to learn. <laughs> okay, yeah. So, thank you very much for your attention, ladies and gentlemen. You know they say there's no such thing as a free lunch, well, I happen I to have a, a, around about 30 of these. This is the, the CD of music that we produced for the 10th anniversary of Amiga. Oh, wow. It's called Everybody's Girlfriend, because as you know, Amiga means girlfriend. I've got about 30 of these. I'm going to sell them at 5 euros a piece, and if you want me to sign them, they'll probably be worth two. But if you want me to sign them, I'll gladly do so. Just find me at the back of the room. Thanks very much, guys. Really appreciate it. Next up is Dave Haney. I hope you can get him. Dave.